no matter what I tell you or what anyone else tells you on the boat, you have to be confident in what you're doing. It's like golf with a swing, baseball with your bat, tennis. Everybody has their own swing. Yeah, my swing might be one way. You know, Ronnie might teach you another way or Big Al might teach you this way, but Duffy might teach you this way, but you have to, you have to be comfortable in what you're doing. And how did it start out? Like, what was the origin story? Too much alcohol. Really? Okay. Because <laughs> if God wanted us to have five glass boats, he would have given us five glass trees. It's, it's for fishermen. It's not for taking the wife and the wife's friends. It's, I think that it's a really, really pretty bit. And then there was a blur that went by and ended up in the cockpit as yeah. far as if I can remember. Uh-huh. Hello, everybody. We're back. State of Sport Fishing Podcast presented by Hook Optics and the Bill Fish Company. Tonight, we have a, a new year podcast and we have a new guest. It's uh, Austin Robbins from the Max Bet, a good friend of mine that frequents Ocean City and stay in Los Buenos in the winter. So Austin, welcome, my 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 friend. Thanks for having me. Yeah, man. I know you pretty well. I met you. Uh, I met you on the you. You were the guest mate on the Bill Fisher. 2012. Yeah. Uh, John Duffy. John Duffy said, we said, just do whatever he wants to do. I said, okay, I don't know anything about fishing anymore. <laughs> well, if you feel any better, that only worked when you were on there. Because <laughs> then I got told to do whatever Chris wanted to do. So, um, yeah. So I, that's when I met you, it was 2012. You were, I mean, how many years were you fishing by then? Um, I started fishing in 2004. Okay. So yeah, you were almost a decade into it. Yeah. Oh four, oh five. It was oh four winter. I moved to Oregon Inlet and um started riding out with people. And then oh five took my first full time. Oh, oh four winter into oh five spring going into the summer. So how'd you get into fishing overall? Um I don't even know. Kind of a really answers. weird story. I was doing floor covering at a high school and uh the company I worked for got a phone call to go down to do a couple boats in Oregon Inlet. And we were putting carpet in boats and um it was actually Brenner Parks from a smoker. Um, he, we were putting carpet on his boat, and he was like, "Hey, um, you ought to ride out with us one day, you know, or go fishing with us one day." And um, I kind of didn't think anything about it, and always loved fishing. And my dad used to always go out of Hatters when I was a kid, and um, so I started driving down, riding out with people. Met Backlash and Dave Graham, Brenner, Jordan Crosswick was Brenner's mate at the time, and Joel Weir was kind of in that process, and. Uh, was blessed enough for them guys to let me ride out with them. And um, I got to ride out and bagged ice every morning, loaded ice, cut chum, and um, kind of just took off from there. All over putting carpet inside of a boat. Wow. <laughs> but you, I mean, I guess you, did you have an affinity for fishing before that? Or you were just kind of like. No, no I did not. No, I, it, it's, that's co- probably the most ironic part about my career is I, uh, I never saw this coming as a kid. I mean, I, I like outdoors hunting, fishing and stuff, but I never, um, I, I just like to work and went down there and met some of them guys and saw the money they were making and getting to do what they loved and getting paid to do it. It was um, one of those things that was like, wow, like I can get paid to go do what I love, something I love. Yeah. Did you, and did you, I mean, like just the, I don't know, I, I always was part of it for me was always just being around the docks. Like I felt like that was just a cool, cool part of like a cool I don't want yeah. to call it a fraternity, but a cool, cool community to be, be part yeah, well, of. I was from Virginia. And um, so like the only time I was around the docks, which I completely skipped Virginia Beach. I was one of the ones that spent no time in Virginia Beach and went right to Oregon Inlet. And um, the only time I was around the docks when my family would take a week's vacation and we'd go to Oregon Inlet. Now I would go to those docks three or four nights of the week. Saw what the boys caught, threw in. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, 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 Jeff James was from my hometown. Britton Shackford was from my hometown. So I, I knew some guys that kind of had a little bit of it in there. I got you. But um, the way I entered the business was definitely more random than I, I'm not going to say as a kid, I knew I was going to be a fisherman or I couldn't wait to be a, I didn't have that field's blood, you know, where there's like grown up into it and got to be around it the whole youth career. I, um, I kind of didn't go into it till post high school. Yeah. And then, so what was your, I mean, you start your job there running boats or not running boats, but working on boats in 04. Yeah, I, uh, I was, uh, I was working at BC shop in the winter and, um, Ben Horning, myself, um, Backlash. I mean, it was a group of us. We would work there in the winter time. And then, um, you know, Ben was working on the hooker 
Backlash was running the hat on the ball. I think he had just gotten off the haphazard or somewhere in that realm. And um, me and Backlash, Backlash was hands down a, a big part of my career. Yeah. He uh, really took me under his wing. And um, I was living with him in Wan Cheese. For people who don't know, this is Daniel Davis, Daniel Davis Backlash. Yeah. That uh, If you don't know him, we should, we should get him on the pod because yeah, he's, he's I, uh, I highly player. recommend that. But I, I tell you, he is hands down one of the bigger reasons I'm in this industry. And uh, he kind of took me under his wing. I lived at his house in Juan Cheese, and he didn't, he didn't charge me anything. You know, if I was working and he let me stay, sleep on the couch so I could go fishing. And um, he got me a job on the rebate with uh, Junior Baum. And um, Junior was actually, I, don't, I think he was the son of Harry Baum, who caught the Atlantic world record out of Oregon, Illinois. Wow. And um, I finished with him on the rebate for about five weeks in the season, <laughs> and I got fired. And um, – I was like all upset and all the guys that I worked with in the shop, were like, don't get upset. Well, there's a guy coming back from Mexico that's looking for someone. Why, why'd you get fired? It couldn't have been because. Um, I just, I was so of green. Lack of hard work. Think, yeah. No, I was green. And I, I think he was, he didn't have the patience to really go that route. I guess right. And, um, you know, back in those days in Oregon, man, it was, it was hot and heavy. I mean, if, if you yeah. missed the boat, there was three guys waiting to take your spot. I mean, right. it, it was way different than it is now. And uh, I wouldn't even say now, then, but as the evolution of fishing went, you know, it definitely uh, there was a time where if you missed the boat, you lost your job. Yeah. And um, I, I, to be honest with you, the same day I got fired, I was going to quit. I, uh, I, I, it was one of those days we had both had it out with each other. And, and you know what? Knowing what I know now is probably the best thing that ever happened to me. Um, and Backlash and him came and grabbed me. Backlash was my dock partner. And I had worked with Walt on the um, Hunter and Nolan was on there. He taught me a lot. Joe Weir backlash and um long story short they were all like don't get i was like ready to just go back home and go back to flooring because i was like you know i, I can't afford to keep trying and i got to start making a living and um justin ringer was bringing the swordfish back from mexico and was looking for a mate and i got on there and steve hall was on there to help him for two weeks and he's like look i'll bring you on here and show you the ropes get you dialed in and it'll be your show and um that was the start of my career and Justin was one of the best things that ever happened to me. I mean, the relationship me and him had and the fishery that me and him did, it was, it was pretty special. I, uh, very blessed. Um, I will never forget those years I had in the swordfish and, nice. um, fished with him for a couple of years and then started traveling and then came back to Oregon Inlet. Um, but I, I guess that was one of the biggest things if I had to say nowadays was a big part of my career was I definitely kind of bounced all over. I, um, I tried, yeah, to get as many places, I tried to get as many places as I could, fish with as many good people as I could, and been extremely blessed to fish with a lot of really good guys. And um, so, but Oregon was definitely the hub to my start and with Justin on the swordfish, and um, that's kind of where it started. And you've maintained a lot of those relationships over the years. You were on the boat uh, with, with Paul Spencer, Paul. right? Yeah, and, and, and to do one even crazier is um, my first traveling job was with Eddie Wheeler in 2006 on the Cabana for the same owner, that he's work, same owner that he's working for now. And, I um, mean, you know, for Frank and him to be tied up a couple slips down for me in Ocean City and then also be down here in Los Angeles with us, it's pretty special. You know, I mean, like I said, I worked for Eddie in 06, 07, and then went back to work to Oregon Inlet and then um, stayed there, stayed there, went to work for Justin again, and then went to work for the Spencer Yachts. And I stayed with Spencer's for a while, kind of ping pong through them, you know, would work for them in the summer and then go on another Spencer boat in the wintertime, mm -hmm. kind of however they needed me to go. Daniel, yeah, and Paul, Daniel and Paul were very first class to me. <laughs> he has a pretty incredible, I mean, what was that, the fish, the big fish you caught? It was, it was a great, yeah, right? Yeah, I caught that with Justin in the Oregon 1077. We got you. What boat was that? Uh, that, that was swordfish. on the swordfish? Wow. Mm -hmm. Yep. It was, uh, it was actually a fun fish trip. It was not even a charter. I got you. Didn't you win a big tournament though with, with Paul or was that somebody else? Um, yeah. Well, um, we weighed a fish, me and Paul and Daniel weighed a fish in a big rock. And then we won the Hatteras Marlin club that same year. And then 2000, let's see, Eleanor was born. So 2014, we weighed that fish on the gratitude in ocean city. I got you. Okay. I, yeah. I got, I got the, them mixed up then but i was with them for a while like i said i mean I, even though i left them if they call, it was they were the type of people when daniel and paul called i i would go back yeah yeah it's kind of how my i i, I kind of kept close to paul paul was always first class with me and um so was daniel and daniel was starting just starting to run a boat and that was cool for me because 
he was young and super jacked up and we bounce ideas off each other. And just like me and Justin, I mean, Justin was, I mean, like I say, the, the list of the guys I worked for and really blessed and, and all that nice. state, you know, in that era. Nice. Well, I mean, it's worked well for you. And now you're running one of Paul's, I would say one of his best boats, but I mean, that's subjective of opinion. Um, yeah. That relationship uh, isn't what it used to be. <laughs> yeah. So fast forward, I don't know, call it the decade. We'll yeah. I mean, pass. so I left Oregon Inlet and then it was, um, I was actually working for Daniel and Paul on the, um, the wound up. And that was my first season in ocean city. And we finished up at ocean city. Richard Ben was a partner with, uh, um, Paul on the boat. And, um, Jimmy Fields come up to me one afternoon. He was like, Hey, do you want to go to Venezuela? Do you want to go back to Venezuela? I'd, I'd went there a fall before with uh, Jimmy Grant for a little bit. And I was like, yeah. He's like, well, my dad's looking for a mate. He's in St. Thomas. He'll fish a moon in St. Thomas and then go to Venezuela. And um, I was actually supposed to go to Australia that winter. But when I caught the big fish in Oregon, Island, it was like, I caught one here in my backyard. I've done it. Not saying that I still would have loved going to Australia, but I, I really, really, really wanted to go to Venezuela. And I knew yeah. that would probably be my only chance. So I went down there with Big Al and got to fish alongside Jimmy and Jimmy Grant and Hans and Ronnie and Butch and Ryan Higgins and Brady on the Viking demos. I mean, it was an elite crowd. And um, I was working for Big Al. And that was also an epic job that I, I mean, Big Al taught me a lot. Yeah. And Tell us about that. I mean, that was, was that the rude awakening? Yes, sir. Yeah. It was the rude awakening. We took the 55. We left Venezuela. I mean, we left St. Thomas with Ronnie. And um, left there, went to um, Venezuela, and we fished that fall, and it was the most insane fishing I've ever seen. Yeah, I mean, fishing I mean, in Costa Rica is good, but that style of fishery that at any moment the turn you didn't know what was going to pop up is pretty special. Yeah, I mean Ronnie back in the day down there, he was putting on a clinic. I mean all of us. I mean it was good fishing for everyone. Everybody was getting between fifteen and twenty white marlin bites a day, two to five blue marlin bites a day, and three to six sail bites a day. And I mean, and the cool part about Venezuela is it reminded me a lot of Costa Rica, take away the calm part, that you woke up and went. You didn't really care about the weather. Fishing was so good, you just went fishing. Yeah, and it wasn't a – it's not a horrendously long ride, is it? No, yeah. no. I mean, the offshore stuff, I mean, from what I remember, would have been, you know, 25, 30 miles, and some of the inshore stuff would be 15 to 16 miles. Nice. You know, we had options. You'd fish off the power plant. You'd fish the bank. You'd fish offshore. You could go down there and fish off of – um. I think it was called Los Rocas or Las Rocas or something like that. And um, and that fishery, I would say that fishery definitely is what broadened my eyes to the difference in your everyday fishing anywhere else in the world. You know, you, when you have to be prepared for a blue one to show up on the chain or a white one to pop your flat line out and all of a sudden 300 pounds or each a chain, you know, it, it, it definitely taught you how to, you know, really control a cockpit and, um, be prepared for everything, you know, and, and, and that and people look at that and say, oh, well, what's the difference? You know, it's you're fishing those tournaments. And a lot of those tournaments back in Venezuela, they were 20 pound class tournaments. So your leaders were only 15 foot. Yeah. So, you know, that was a different, you know, fishing that way different for blue ones. And, and then, like I say, fishing was that the first time that you ever seen fishing at that, like at that rate that maybe, you know, we're, we're more used to it now off the mid Atlantic, but you hadn't, you hadn't seen fishing like that. Actually, in, I, I was pretty blessed in Oregon Inlet. I mean, those years I was in Oregon Inlet fishing off Hatteras. I yeah. mean, it was, we caught, me and Justin caught five slams one year. And I mean, numerous days go down there, see a, a blue or two and four or five whites or. Yeah, but not like 20. Five. Like it was. No, a, no, like no, 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 20, absolutely 20, not. No, yeah. I mean, no. I, matter of fact, I, um, that year before I went to Venezuela, fishing was actually really good in, um, really good in Ocean City. Like the day before I left, we caught 15. Wow. But I mean, it's different though. It's different. I mean, it's, you know, you'd be out there catching in Venezuela, you'd be out there catching five, six, seven, all of a sudden, a three, 400 pounder show up on the teaser. You know, it just, yeah, yeah. And it was very consistent. It wasn't like you got one or two days of it. It was yeah, every, yeah. Day. every day. So, and, and, and then also back then, which is something I, I say a lot of nowadays, and I don't want to take credit from some of these younger guys, but we didn't have the help that these guys have nowadays. You know, it was, yeah. it was much different. Every boat you were on, you were pretty much by yourself. You know, like we didn't take a Venezuelan fishing and in St. Thomas, we didn't take a guy fishing. It was Were you dredge fishing then, yeah. by then? I yeah. And, and, and all bait. We didn't use rubber back then. It was yeah, all yeah. bait. You know, you took, you know, we'd fish a double mullet dredge and a triple ballyhoo dredge and um, two chains, four baits. 
just pretty much identical to Ocean City. Yeah. And um, but Big Al was awesome. He he taught me a lot. We got a ton of bites, and um, he taught me a lot about like um, like I said, doing it by myself. Because a lot of times it would be just me, him. We had a younger kid that would come with us. His would he jump Eddie. in too and help you or no? Yeah, yeah, he would. And um, he was kind of like just the young kid on the boat that just kind of cleaned and he learned a lot there. And um, I mean, Big Al, would he? Would he would oh, he, yeah. Big Al, yeah. Big Al taught me a lot. He taught me a lot about like fishing tides, banks, um, taught me a lot about how to read water. That man could, I mean, I, I mean, I speak for that whole family, but that man could really, um, he was just ate up with it. And uh, yeah. he was awesome to fish for. And he was as jacked up as you were every day. And I mean, he was not young, you know, and it was cool. And the cool part about Venezuela is when you were there, if you weren't fishing on your boat, you were going on your bow that morning and hopping on with either Hans or Higgins or Ronnie, you know, somebody be picking you up off the bow to go. Yeah. So you were fishing every day and Gar was our dock partner. So like if we weren't going and Gar was going, we would go, I'd go with Gar, you know, or vice versa. So you, you got to talk about these day. people. Like, I don't like, we don't. I don't know who all you're talking about. So yeah, well, like like Gar Gar Warmer, I think is his last name. He was running a boat called the Sea Check. Okay. Um, DJ ran that boat, and then Ronnie was on the Big O. Um, Ryan Higgins was on the Viking Demo. Hans on the Vintage. Jimmy Grant on the Waterman. Butch on the um, Prime Time. So like, if if you weren't going, they would always you could just you know chew on a boat, yeah. night before, yeah, and yeah, just be on your bow the next morning, and you'd get to go. Nice. And that was kind of cool. So you, you never really sat at the dock. So you got to fish every day. And going home wasn't really an option because um, it was so hard. You know, the logistics yeah. of getting out of there wasn't easy. Yeah. And that's... that was really the last year. I mean, I think a couple of guys stayed, but that was really much the last year of that fishery. Wow. Then it all kind of fell apart there. Yeah, that's when it, I mean, we left kind of in a panic. You know, we were told, like, you need to get the heck out of here. Gotcha. So, but, um, and then left Venezuela. I could see some of that crowd going, do we really need to leave? Are you sure? Yeah. Well, I mean, we all left. I mean, I think it was only one or two guys. Yeah, that were, yeah. And at the time they were Venezuelan or, you know, they were flagged differently to where they could stay. And then we left. And then um, I got back home and was trying to figure out what I was going to do. I even contemplated leaving fishing. And um, that's when I met up with Glenn Cameron and started fishing with him in the winter. And then that was a whole different league of learning that whole style of fishery. A lot of detail goes into that fishing in, in, South, in Stewart. Oh my comes God. To- yeah. That, I, I actually, I take it to another level and say that everything South of Ponce Inlet, it, it has its own style, you know, whether you're fishing off Ponce, Fort Pierce, Daytona or Stewart, or then you go a step further to Palm beach, Pompano, Lauderdale, Miami keys, even the live bait stuff. I mean, I did a lot of that with Eddie and Neil on mm-hmm. the sand or Eddie on the cabana and Neil on the Sandman. And I mean, even that fishery has got its own, the detail to that stuff is just so like, I mean, Nick would know. I mean, yeah. it's, it's its own different level. What and, did, uh, I mean, if, if Venezuela taught you to be ready for anything, what did, what did Stuart teach you working with Glenn? Um, um, how to be, how to have your stuff right at all. To, well, that's kind of a bad way to put it. Um, Glenn taught me a lot about never, never giving up. That was one thing Glenn was incredible at. Like you might be having a really bad morning or a really good morning and then have a law or vice versa. And um, Glenn was, one of the most positive attitude captains I ever worked for. He never gave up. I mean, there was numerous times I could tell you we were either having a great morning and walking the tournament or having a horrible morning and being behind. And then he would pull the most unbelievable move. And then we'd be walking the tournament. You know, I mean, it was, it was pretty crazy. And then you just deal with so many bonitas, you know, you wanted it to be rough, cold. And the amount of bait we were rigging back then was just, it was, it's a, it's crazy to think about it now. Yeah. Looking back. I mean, 200 miles a night. No, you know, we didn't pull the ballots there. It was changing, all miles. Changing the changing, entire dredge yeah, arms out. Everything. Right. Yeah, I mean, you put all new dredges out. Like, you didn't even unsnap them. You just put a whole new dredge out at 12. And that's, yeah. I'm not saying it was overthinking it, but that's definitely not. But it was a, at a time during then where it felt like, you know, you were in that er, in that time in the world during during that season it seemed like there was a lot of really competitive boats there oh a lot of them that God. live in a lot of them that live in costa rica or go to costa rica now instead of fishing there and it was but there it seems like the mates probably might have a little bit more control 
over maybe whether you're winning or losing because you can maybe because you're fishing once like there's a pack of fish or a couple wrecks a couple pieces of structure you're almost fishing right on top of each other and you're fishing super shallow water so you almost have to out present them yeah and, well, and the way the exactly. way your dredges That's look and the way your bait swim is important because a sail a steward sailfish or a south florida sailfish is kind of a kind of a pain of a fish to catch sometimes that's a good question you know and like glint like when i tell you a flat line never got one flat line never got pinned down all day and yeah. you know it, it was me kp mikey timmy you know somebody on is that, that boat. is that where you learn to like kind of fish as a team yeah. there or, yeah. um i would say that was definitely probably where it really turned me on to like understanding what four anglers could do for you yeah yeah you know, when you had four anglers and you could be a mate and how like, you could manipulate them to to get you to do what they need to do or you could take an angler and really what would be the way to say it? you could master the way an angler fishes because you were able to fully concentrate on making sure their bait was fresh your mm -hmm. chain was good your dredges were good your turn was good instead of worry about trying to have your chain good and also hook one off the flat line at the same yeah, yeah. time you know and John Mead, when he took over that Showtime program with Wink, that was kind of an eye opener for me. That was one of the ones that always kind of stuck out to me. He, you know, he took Fred and Nancy and trained them, and yeah. um, and you start to saw that, and it was like, wow, this damn boat, this this team won't go away. Like it was like they won a tournament, and all of a sudden they kept winning and winning. It was like, damn, it was getting like it was kind of like wow, like when you're not trying to do it all yourself and you can build a team around you, you could be that much more deadly you know and um you know ronnie with gray i mean that was another thing ronnie did i mean when ronnie and gray were going through that circuit yeah they kind of i mean they were I mean, kind they of the standard wiped, then yeah they were wiping people's eyes you know you look at viking you know they'd have higgins and brady and pat and their crew galati whatever and um i just always had a respect for that and you know working with the spencers i got to see a little bit of it but on most other programs i never got to see it like that you know it was more of a a do all catch all kind of deal if that yeah. makes sense I definitely want to credit like the Spencers and, you know, certain teams that just always stuck out Ronnie and what he was doing on the big O and just kind of, those were names that always popped out in my head. It was like, wow. Like, and then I really got to see it when I went to work with Glenn. And I mean, there was a lot of times where we didn't have four anglers, but there were a lot of times where we did. And then I got to see how it kind of worked. So one Wait, of we'll I the prime example, here's a prime example. Like even my first year in ocean city, John Mead, Butch with uh, oh, you were talking yeah, you were talking about the Showtime, about how they coached. Yeah, well, like I said, I mean, I was working for Glenn. It was been my latter years with Glenn. And, um, you know, my wife was pregnant with Eleanor. And I'll never forget it. I was like, I knew my time in those travel tournaments where I was going to have to get a full-time job instead of the freelance world. And um, I just remember John Mead coming through on the Showtime with Wink and just saw what he was doing. And it was kind of like, wow. It kind of opened my eyes to – you don't have to have four and five mates. Not saying that doesn't work. No, no. But it can be very effective on the other end as well. And you don't need to, if you're patient, you know, like I guess getting on a boat like the Big O or with Glenn, like you're you're not seeing the team build. You're you're just as uh, you're just getting into becoming a piece of the team. You know what I mean? Right, whereas right. like whereas like John with Fred and Nancy on the Showtime, they they had you know kind of got in the fishing and said, we really like this. And exactly, you know, and then, yeah, I mean, and, and I've always said this, it was a big inspiration for me going into the max bet. Um, I would definitely say John me in that showtime program because he fished for me when I actually worked on the max bet my first year, we were down with motor work and I came down here to fish with Tony Carrizozo. Um, and John Mead fished with me and hearing him talk about like, well, Fred does this, Nancy does this. I can't remember the other angle they had does this. And it was like, God dang, like, you know, how nice that would be sometimes yeah. to not have to do it all. And, um, well, it's, it's not even, it's a necessity. It's not even a, 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 it's a necessity for being competitive anymore, you know? Yeah. Well, I, I and especially down here, you know, like, yeah, I, I say this all so, the time. It's, all right. It's, bef before we get into the Costa Rica thing, we, you get in the, you get on the max bet with, yeah, uh, I mean, um, I started on the map. I was working for Hans on the vintage, and um, I was actually running that boat just a little bit, getting to learn how to run a boat. And Hans was first class with me. And um, we were fishing all the tournaments and we had a team. And um, the opportunity arose for me to get on the max bet as a mate. And I took the job. And um, that's kind of how that started. And then 
Well, Redneck was running the boat. Matt Carter was yeah. running the boat. And um, did you know Matt and Kelly before that at all, or no? I not. I did not know I had met them. They actually came on the gratitude the day after we weighed the fish because we weighed the fish with Daniel and Paul, and then we laid a day and we were surveying that boat or we were showing that boat on our lay day um, in the White Mountain Open. And um, we weighed that fish and then we had a lay day and we were showing the boat. Matt and Kelly actually walked on the boat to look at it. And um, I did not know who they were. I, at the time, I just knew they were people that were looking at the boat as long as, you know, we had other people that were looking at yeah. right that same day. And um, at the time, I did not know them, no. And you. then um, when I got offered the job to be a mate, I did not know who they were. I flew to Florida, interviewed with them, became their mate, and then went on from there. Yeah. And then eventually you end up. I get the opportunity to run the boat. They uh, they approach me out running the boat. And um, that's kind of a, a story that a lot of people don't know in itself. Um, I got the opportunity to run the boat. And um, right at the time I got the chance to run the boat, my father got diagnosed with brain cancer. And um, I wasn't ready to kind of take that on and deal with that at the same time. And uh, so I approached Matt and Kel about possibly hire an interim captain so I could train them to be the anglers, also be available to go home when I needed to go home and be with my dad. Um, but th- I mean, the big picture of that was, is I didn't want to run a boat if, if, the, if the scenario was perfect and I could train them to be the anglers first and yeah. then start running the boat it would make my job. I felt like easier running the boat after I trained them, like each one individually got them where they needed to be before I started running the boat. So we, um, they were, they were okay with that. And Robbie Valco came on the program and, um, he ran the boat for two years. And, um, and then I took over, we came down to Costa Rica, chartered a boat, Ian on the out. Uh, it was actually the outlaw then. And, um, we came down here, fished with Ian, and um, the first year had unbelievable fishing, 40 bite days every day. And really got, that was where I got to really show them, like, there was, it didn't matter. You miss one, you hook one, you break one off, you backlash, it didn't matter. You know, we, I sat with them, me and Thomas Garmany, AKA Smalls, and we would sit with them and, you know, I worked with them and worked with them and worked with them. And um, so then we leave here and it was like, from that moment forward in that first year, which would have been like 2015, every time that we were on the boat, even chubb ocean city or wherever we went they were hooking fish or at least trying yeah yeah. and i i really scaled my pride down and worried about what we flew in the rigor because it, i felt like in the end result it was going to benefit the bigger picture allowing them to really learn because they were willing to be patient and learn so i felt like i had to be patient with them and to be honest with you it it, it went a lot smoother than i originally thought it would and um i mean what I can say about them too now, I couldn't speak highly enough about their angler capabilities. Yeah. Um, and I'm not, I, I don't want it to sound like I'm bragging that I taught them to be what they are, but they, they were the ones that were like, I know, oh, I got it. You know, if they missed one, they would put the rod down, pin it down, step back and like, okay, what did we do wrong? Yeah. And then we would analyze every fish. And luckily we were in an area where you could do that. You know, we so- were Go ahead. One of the uh, what mistakes are common for an angler when we're talking about catching catching billfish on light tackle like for like we're like we're used to do it 20, 20, 30 pound outfits, you know, team fishing. What's what's a fishing for sales, whites, blues? What I would say the eyes? Yeah, I think and I think a lot of people would question me on this, but I'm a big believer that the eyes will deceive what your bite is. And I always made a, a point to tell Matt and Kelly, you make sure you know what you got before you let it go. Or you feel that you, you know, and people would say, oh, well, if you feel it, they feel it. Everybody has their own opinion of how that process works. Mm-hmm. But I believe the eyes can really mess up an angler. Um, like if you I see also- a big, like I'm, I th- something for example, I don't know if you, an example that I see a lot is blue Marlin big hole on your bait, but he pushes it out of the way. And the next thing you know, you're, you're dumping it back there. And he's just like wondering around where, where his bait went. And, and, and and I don't want to rewind, but this is a really big part of where I feel like my success of being able to teach anglers to be good anglers were us is I was blessed with Eddie backlash, Justin ringer, big wave, Dave. I mean, the list could go on. Um, I had a lot of guys that were great coaches. Mm-hmm. Duffy, Duffy was another great one. And they were great coaches of telling you things that you might not have known was happening when it was happening. Yeah. yeah. And one of the things I always used to tell Matt and Kel was no matter what I tell you or what anyone else tells you on the boat, you have to be confident in what you're doing. It's like golf with a swing 
baseball with your bat, tennis, everybody has their own swing. Yeah, my swing might be one way. You know, Ronnie might teach you another way or Big Al might teach you this way, but Duffy might teach you this way. But you have to you have to be comfortable in what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And I, I made clear that I didn't want Kelly to try to be me. Matt tried to be Kelly. You know, I, I wanted them to have their own way, but then try to perfect their way as anglers. And yeah. um, one of the big things that always came to my mind was like, we have a routine on the max bet. And these things, there's three or four things that don't change. I mean, they're, they're, they're the status quo of the max bet as anglers. And it goes for Nicole, Anthony, Paige, anybody that steps on the max bet, we kind of have a guideline of things we do. And I learned that from Duffy. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you got to set these, these statutations or whatever that word may be, that if these things don't go that way, it, things can get messed up. And then the other anglers might not know what to do in that scenario. So yeah. those were some of the bigger things that I pushed very hard was that one, we don't rotate. And a lot of people would argue that with me and saying, Oh, well, everybody needs to be better. Well, I disagree. I, you know, Ken Griffey was a great center fielder, you know, yeah. um, Michael Jordan was a great shooting guard. You know? Now, do you, do you rotate during, during practice days or fun fishing days? Just well, like, so like, and that's a great question, you know, absolutely. When, a lot of times when I have just Matt and Kel, mm -hmm. them two will step back on the riggers and they'll have the riggers and the flat lines and they too play their day. And you know what? I love it because then they're getting to do everything. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah. and gotcha. they both have been invited to fish on other boats. So we're like, Matt's been on the vintage and he's had to fish a rigger or Kelly's been on, you know, another boat and she's got a fish dish. You know, we fished with John on the showtime. We fished with, um, you know, we fish on the goose and we, we fish with rich bear, and the shark, <laughs> you gotta sit. but they, um, you know, they, they learn those things on other boats and, and Kelly and Matt have both. I feel confident with them in any position on the boat. But when it comes to the, the max bet fishing daily, yeah, yeah, yeah. Kelly's left flat, Matt's right flat, Anthony's right long. And then when we're in our tournament scenario, we have Nicole on the left long. And if not, it would be the mate on the left long. And yeah. that doesn't change. That way, when we do a turn, everybody knows their role. And we're never guessing. No one's ever guessing their, their job in that turn. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that rotating is a bad thing, but for me, it just works for us. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, there's just a couple rules that we kind of keep on the boat. Like we don't crank up fish on the dredge fish on the train. We do not crank up. Leave we, it find back it. we keep it back there in the clear water. They'll find it. <laughs> I had a, I don't know, a couple of years ago, just the clear, the phrase clear water makes me laugh. We had a fish on the teaser in the white in like first day of the white Marlin open. We were having a pretty good day. And, uh, I didn't want to, I just wanted to wind the bait up a little bit. And our angler, Ernie Eckenrode, one of our anglers, I was like, I was getting frustrated because we had, we were having a good day and we, but we were had not having a good, our average, I think we were like five for five for eight or nine on the first day. And we'd kind of gone through, missed a couple. And uh, I had my, uh, there was a fish on the left teaser coming up. And I, I typically, like to leave it back in the clean water as well but in this instance i it just would not switch so i was just like ernie wind wind your bait up and i asked him like three times and finally i was like ernie wind your fucking bait up and he looks up at me and goes i like it back there in the clean water and they just waffles it finally after a minute well you know and it, it's funny you bring that up because there are scenarios and i'm blessed like down here chris Cornell is my tower guy mm -hmm. and i if chris says something i trust him yeah, yeah. Um, but Matt and Kel have a trust in me that if I tell Matt and Kel to come up, yeah, they'll, they'll come do it. Yeah. Yeah. But I will tell you what we have started doing, even in it just in the recent year, like in the last year, is I'll have my pro go in, like go off the dredge on I a fish you. like that. Instead of instead of them coming up and getting that erratic, what I call low mm -hmm. statistic bite, mm -hmm. I'll have my pro go in with a bait off the dredge or chain. And yeah. if they miss them there, at least you have your flat line and a rigger to back you up where yeah. at that point, you know, you might only have a rigger or a, in a turn, you might have a very close two riggers together, if that makes sense. And, um, and we have scenarios like that, but one thing that we're really good on the max bet is, um, and again, I'm very blessed with this is, uh, if I speak something, they listen, if they say something, I trust them enough to where I listen. Yeah. You know, it's, if Kelly says, I didn't get bit. It didn't eat me. I trust her. If Matt yeah. says Austin, he missed me. I trust him. Yeah. And yeah. Um, if Anthony goes bit and I didn't see nothing or Chris didn't see nothing, I still trust that it might've been a bite. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's a big thing for me that I think is um, been a big part of 
some of our successes this that we we have definitely formed a communication and you know we wear headsets but my team does not wear headsets it's just me and chris with them yeah yeah you know my team is like my english don't have headsets and um and i really like that for our boat because it allows a power to talk and everybody to listen so so when you so say you mark a couple you mark one and then you raise them Chris talks to you and then you talk to the cockpit. Um, it depends. So I have the ability to mute for me and Chris to just talk. Oh, and I then I have you. the ability for me and Chris to both come through. Oh, me I and Chris you. have a great understanding or Justin for that matter, who fishes with me in ocean city. Um, they both have an understanding if I start talking and it's not like I'm trying to be their boss or anything like that. No, but, but you're just, driving the boat. Yeah. yeah. It's if, if I start talking, they, they quiet, but if Chris is talking, I'll just be quiet and let Chris take over. Yeah. And, um, and the other thing that we started doing last year is we do, I do give the mate now, like my head mate, whether it was Alex or now becoming Marshall mm-hmm. or Timmy or Andrew Blair, I give them a headset. So if something happens down there, they can also talk to me. And that was something I was kind of naive to the first couple of years with the headsets. And that's been a big game changer for us. Uh, it was actually a huge game changer this year in the poor girls. Um, we pulled that blue one off and I didn't even know they pulled it off. We were in a turn and the rod was bent over, but it was such a drag from so far back. I couldn't tell it had pulled off mm-hmm. and had Chaser. I remember Chaser Luke had told me it was gone. I wouldn't have known. And then we were able to get the bite again and catch it. But um we 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 don't talk a lot. Like when things are going on, we're pretty quiet. But it's we have a great. We all have a respect for each other. And when someone's talking, to listen. Yeah. And um, you know, one of the things I really preach is a, a a chain of command in the cockpit, to a chain of command to the bridge, to a chain of command through the tower. Because your mate has to have control. If he does not, there's no. In my mind, there's no boss. And and you got to have faith in your mate. I always say. I always say like if. If the captain's the head coach, then the 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 mate is the quarterback. You know, he's the one you're kind of putting them in position to succeed. And then he's the one that's got to kind of get everybody to to do the right things. You know what yeah, I mean? And, and when I worked for Duffy, which I know you could probably vouch for this. um, That was one of the biggest things I took out of working for Johnny was Johnny was just such a vocal captain in all aspects. Um <laughs> But I mean this in a respectful way. Yeah, yeah, Johnny yeah. was really good. That like if if me or Chris or whoever was working for him looked up at him and said, "Hey," he was pretty good with understanding that like we're like serious. Like, hey, it's a backlash, or hey, we have an issue, or hey, we need to go get this fish. Yeah. And at the time, there was guys I worked for that wouldn't listen to that, and yeah. um, and that was a big eye opener for me. And then you know when fishing and fishing with Glenn, and you, you know you're you're going through six bonita bites to get one sail bite or you're in Venezuela and you get two whites up and then a blue one eats and the captain doesn't see the blue one, but you see it, mm-hmm. you know, that, that, that trust and saying, Hey, cat, that was a blue one, you know, and yeah, yeah. you know, you don't see everything, especially nowadays with these damn sonars. No, between the sonars and the binoculars, you're not half yeah. the time. You're mo- most of the yeah. time. You're not even looking backwards and anymore. I will tell you, I was 100% one of them guys that did not like a tower guy. When yeah. I first started running a boat, I was like, screw this. I don't like it. And then Gornell got on the boat. And we had a couple of tower guys in the beginning that just didn't work out. But then Gornell got on the boat. It was like, okay, this works. Mm -hmm. And it works well. Like it works really well. And he has taken such a pressure off of me um, to be able to look in my binos. And I mean, he never leaves my side. Like when I'm running, he's next to me. When I'm running out in the morning, he's next to me. And that, and that's a big thing for me. You know, he might see a flopper that I don't see or a tailor that I don't see. You know, if I need to go down to the engine room, I can give the boat to him or Timmy and I have full confidence that they know what they're looking at. And uh, that's been a big thing. Matt and Kel have been amazing at letting us per, um, surround ourselves with good help. Yeah. yeah. You know, and, uh, and, 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 you know, a lot of times I sacrifice myself and not hiring a full-time mate when I probably should, because something might be, you know, interim or we're, we're going to a yard or, you know, we did a major refit on that boat. And, um, but the, there's a big trust between myself Kelly and Matt that I, um, I, I have a lot of respect for, and, um, I, I, I can't talk about it enough into a program, um, especially as anglers to captain and I'm young, you know, I, I mean, it's really the only boat I've ever ran. Yeah. And, um, you know, they put a lot of faith in me and they were unbelievable with the stuff with my dad. And, you know, I come down here and 
I had a very experienced mate that didn't work out because he was just above me. You know, he was way better than I was. And it took me to learn the hard way through a lot of getting sacked up and stuff, but it, it, it only made me stronger. And, yeah, I mean, you know, it, like, I don't know. You, we kind of had the similar path is that we had to kind of had to build the programs and be patient about it. You know, like, I don't know when I started running a boat and I'm sure, you know, in your mind, in your optimism, in your mind, you feel like you're just going to go out there and it's just going to be, you're just going to, you're going to take all that you learned from all these amazing boats that you worked on. And you're just going to be like, like that, it's going to work. And it don't work that way. At least no. in, in my case, you well, know? I'll give you a prime example. I sat Eddie Wheeler down one night and I was like, man, I apologize for 16 years ago <laughs> because I had no goddamn idea that it was uh, this tough. And, you know, I, I, I'm, one thing I won't give a lot of credit, I probably won't name enough names, but I, I have a very blessed amount of um, people that supported me when I started running a boat from you to Johnny to Jake Farley to Rich Fair. I mean, the, the list just, I was very blessed. Butch, Butch Cox and Big Wave. And like I said, I, I was extremely, extremely overwhelmed with how many people wanted me to do okay. You know, Billy, Gerlach yeah. and... I mean, I, I just, I, there wasn't a person I could call that made me feel like an idiot because there was definitely times I asked some stupid ass fucking stupid, sorry, stupid ass questions. Yeah. And there was some times where I didn't know what I was doing or I was nervous. I remember one time I was driving the boat and I got into a bad spot, didn't know what to do. And Bennett was sitting next to me and he was like, here, just do this, do that. And yeah, yeah. really helped me out. And, uh, you know, to have people that could have easily gone the other way and been like, fuck you, screw up yeah, yeah. and laugh at you. They didn't. And um, I'm forever grateful for that because um, I wasn't one of those guys that um, <coughs> I, I tried to really work my way up to be a captain. And I you never were, saw. I felt like you were, you're, you're considering your experience in the cockpit. I felt like you were very patient and I don't know if you were just looking for the right job or just the, the kind of opportunity kind of presented itself to you with, with Matt and Kel, but like, I felt like, I don't know, like you, you were definitely the, a uh, like I wasn't a really, really good mate. Like you were, I just kind of stumbled into my job. And one day my boss was like, well, why don't you just drive this thing? You know, where like, yeah, I, um, I, I definitely, um, I was scared to run a boat. And the main reason I was scared was, um, I was part of some scenarios that weren't very fun, you know, yeah. whether you ran aground and bad things happened. And I was always like, I'm making a lot of money as a mate winning tournaments, freelancing, Make not taking not muscle. taking on a whole bunch of responsibility. Yeah. And I was you know? like, why do I want this? And then my wife kind of got in my ear and was like, you know, you you can't do this the rest of your life. Your hands hurt. You're not, I mean, and I, I was still young, but your hands were hurting. And I was having, you know, we had two children and I, and it was time. And if it wasn't for people like Big Wave and Robbie and you know, yourself and Tucker and Johnny, you know, I I, I don't know if I would have been pushed as I don't know if I would would have jumped as fast as it happened with Matt and Kel. I probably would have said just hire Robbie and I'll stay a mate, but yeah, I'm so thankful that I didn't because I, I absolutely love driving a boat. Now I love the new challenge. I love that every day I could be as good as I was in the cockpit or I could be as bad as anybody else out there. And, yeah. to, and to be honest with you, I was really scared to not be good more days than I was scared to be good. Good. How about the Like when you start to, get into running the boat there was a long time where i just i felt like i fished not to 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 not not catch anything you know what i mean like to not have a sucky day or get sacked up and which just led to me having shitty days <laughs> you know like you know it's i mean from a let's just talk about it in a in a fishing aspect because the, the 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 responsibility of running a boat especially on your level is 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 kind of insane but just from a, a fishing and an, a competitive and an enjoyment aspect for the owners and the anglers like i always felt like man i, I didn't want to there was i don't know like two or three years ago i started to think like think for myself but i would just follow the crowd but i would be like then i would i'd like pick a s spot on the chart and i'd be like oh man that looks really good and i'd be like oh well, all the reports and all the all the good boats are going here so i was like yeah i'll just go there but i didn't know we didn't fish enough back then and i didn't know why the Bill Fisher or the Real Joy or some other boat is going to that specific location, and I didn't know how to fish it. And I felt like, but if I'm there, I must be in a good spot, you know, which it was. But 
we we never would we'd just be watching the show when i'd look around like i remember a couple times i'd just be like oh well i mean the sea toys here the demo boats here the bill fishers here i'm like oh well this is this has got to be the spot you know and it was for them but it wasn't for me i feel that way sometimes when i pull up next to the blood money <laughs> don't say that but, but no, uh, no, early, like, early but was, you know like it takes a little time of falling on your face to get to figure it out you know and there's Absolutely. no other way to really do it and, and you know it's funny you bring that up and in my first two years of running the boat and then i you know i went through a that stage where my dad died and Cricket had to run the boat for me in the White Mountain Open, but I, I'll never forget. Um, I was running the boat for the Mid Atlantic. It was that year that Cricket ran the boat for me when I had to go home, and uh, I came back after my dad passed, or no, he passed. Uh, anyway, I came back, and I had been gone from the boat for a week during the White Mountain Open, my first White Mountain Open ever going to run the boat, and I just had a different mindset. Like you know, I don't have to always be where everyone else is to be competitive, and I. And I really made my mind up that I didn't want to be a follower and not saying that there's a time to follow because there's numerous times there. I'm not going to let just some report deter what I've seen and you know, what I feel is okay. Yeah. yeah. And um, down here, really, really tone that in when you're fishing next to Bill Fisher and Tar Heel and Galati and Rum Runner and Legron. I mean, the list down here just goes forever. That's only in West um, Virginia. And um, they, um, that was when I really started to learn that, you know, watching Ben Horning is a guy I've always kind of looked up to as a captain. You know, Ben will go do some things and you're like, why is he doing that? And it's maybe because he doesn't have to be in the crowd to compete. Yeah. And um, I've always said that, you know, pre-fishing days, everybody wants to go where they're getting bites. Mm-hmm. I don't do that a lot. A lot of days in my pre-fishing, I'll run two hours pick up, run two hours pick up. Yeah. Well, some boats, it's all it's all different scenarios because some boats, they got to get their people some shots and get and get rolling or they're not going to, but you don't, you guys go hard down there. So you don't have to worry about it. Yeah, that. but I also believe in if you're not getting, for an example, that's a great point. But there's also a thing that I heard one time from John Bayless and John Duffy that will never leave me is... You can get them all the shots in the world you want out of bounds. But yeah, yeah, bounds, yeah, yeah. You know, and 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 for me down here, especially that matters because a lot of times our fishing can be out of bounds where you're getting your bites. Yeah, yeah. You got to tell yourself down as a captain to say, hey, I can't keep running 63 miles when I can only run 50. Yeah. And I have to be as dialed in. They can't catch what I don't see. Yeah. So I have to be as dialed in at what I'm going to see for them to catch what the boat's going to see. And um, down there, you have to. Like you can't just wait two hours in the morning of the first day to, to to dial it in. You have to be show up to a spot and basically be like, look around, put your so look around, look at your bottom machine, look at your sonar, and figure out like in an instant whether it's going to be the spot that you're going to dedicate the first hour to, and hopefully start getting them. You know, leg three, day three, I ran ninety one miles before I caught my first billfish. <laughs> <laughs> So when I tell you, I covered, I covered ground. I covered ground before we even caught a fish. Well, let's go because into that. I, Cause I wanted I, to talk, talk to you. Cause I thought, you know, your season last year in Costa Rica was kind of the culmination of what you guys have been trying to build, you know, on the max no for you and Matt and Kel and, you know, um, the rest of the rest of the crew. Let's just go through if we can just quickly, I don't know, quickly, whatever, um, go through what, what those tournaments were because i think i don't know if it was the first leg or the second leg it was the second leg i was like i thought you'd you'd, like i thought you like broke down it was the first leg (laughs) no that first leg um we went out and had a so to start the season we we had had some really good fishing going into leg one and that's something that i i tend to not do down here you can ask matt and kel one of my biggest things i and i'm even saying it this year going into leg one um i always say leg one is my hardest Mm-hmm. because we'll fish new year's and they got to go home. You know, they got kids and stuff and they got, you know, Matt's working and we were going into leg one and we were just having some good fishing. And um, I never forget it. I looked at Matt and Kel and I was like, you know, I, I'm, I'm just feeling, you know, I, I feel good. We're fishing good. The boat's doing good. Y'all are doing good. And we went into leg one and our, I'll never forget it. Day one. I was like, we finished the day and Chris was like, cap, we're right, you know, right where we want to be. And I was like, okay. And then day two, I went right back to where we were just, couple miles south i think i went southwest and it was me and grubs and lagrone and a couple guys and we were blessed enough to win the daily 
And I'll never forget it. I came down at it when, we, when they announced that we won the daily. I came down out of the bridge and I was hugging everybody and just telling them thank you and telling Timmy and Alex and Chris and Quacker and everybody just thanks and Matt and Kel thanks. And I'll never forget it. Gornell looked at me and he's like, now the rest of the week's fun. You know, it's, yeah. it's kind of, you know, but for me, it wasn't like, I was like, now I'm here. Yeah, I yeah. got my chance to finally win a tournament. And um, sure, sure enough, day three, we set out right back where we had left from the daily and um, we're not getting bit. And Billy had already caught a blue one on the bill. Seen Fisher. another one and then caught a sale. And I ran to Billy, get to Billy. And we set out in a, Probably the nicest blue we saw last year. I would have called him four, 450. Ate me alive. I mean, burned my hand up, ate me alive, didn't get him. Then we missed a sale. And then from that point on, like we were still like in second, or we were tied for first or in second, like 12 o'clock. And I'm like, so don't panic. That was the only thing I was probably proud of myself in that leg the most is I, I really never panicked until about the, the last hour. So Billy dried up, I dried up, and we both ran down to, I can't remember who it was, and Billy saw a couple fish, Andy saw a couple fish, and I couldn't see anything, and I was getting mad, like really mad. And here it is, 1.32 o'clock, I have not caught a fish. And you were in the, you were, you just won the we daily. We were winning the would, tournament that morning. Yeah, you were winning, yeah, and you hadn't caught a fish by when? I hadn't caught a fish, and um, Ben Horning texted me, he's like, Cap, your only prayer is going to be to get down here. And, um, I looked at Matt, I was like, we got to go. And I, I told Gornell, I was like, he's like, well, how much time is that going to give us? I'm like, 30 minutes. And he's like, well, heck with it. So we ran. And I ran that boat like I've never ran it. Oh, I'll take that back. I ran it at that moment in time like I've never ran it before. We run down there and we're running. And this goes back to what I was saying earlier about Gornell and Timmy. They were both on side of me and Matt was in the bridge. And I'm going and I hear Eddie calling a triple. And um, Gornell's like, there's a flopper. Timmy goes, there's a flopper. And then I saw one right off the bow. So I pulled it back. And um, I'll never forget it. I pulled it back and I dropped the sonar and there was four blips right in front of me. And I'm like, all right, cool. Go up there, raise a double, catch one out of a double. I hit man overboard. That's something I kind of do that maybe juvenile or whatnot, but I, I do that a lot. I, I still hit, I still mark my bite. Mm -hmm. And um, I come back up, see, got down current of it. And I came back around and um, didn't even get to the mark. And here come another one on the teaser that I didn't mark on the sonar. And I, I'll never forget it. I looked down and I was like, I got 25 minutes and um, I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to go fishing. So I lifted the sonar up and it wasn't because I didn't want to use the sonar. I just, I felt like if I was chasing when they're biting, mm -hmm. I wasn't being efficient. Yeah. And um, so I just drilled that dot and we caught like another one and then kind of went into a law. Everybody went into a law and I'll never forget it. I made a tack and I was coming back down it and uh sail popped the flat line. We hooked the sail and Gornell's like left teaser and I'm just pulling it thinking it's a sale. sale yeah. And all of a sudden he's like, it's a goddamn blue one. Oh, and I start cussing. I'm like, God damn it guys. We need him. <laughs> and then Gilotti calls and hooked up. And I was like, Oh, it doesn't matter. Got to catch him. So I'm like, yeah, yeah. damn it. You know, everybody get it. Blah, blah, blah. And you know, our pro throws the pitch on the max bet. And um, I don't remember what happened. I think Timmy threw the pitch or Alex threw the or Alex threw the pitch. And um, cause Alex is our pro. And um, fish reeled around, eight Matt going away on the outside flat line in the turn. And anyway, fish went up the bow and Matt's went away. And I give all credit to Gornell. Um, had he not been in the tower with that time of day, mm -hmm. seeing where the yeah. fish were, I really would have struggled. And um, I give all credit to him. I mean, he really saved me on that. And ended up catching them both. And Galati got us on time. We got third. Ironically, everybody <laughs> was like all the way in. was like, did you break down? Did someone have COVID? You know, but all in all, I almost think it was one of the best things that ever happened to us in the tournament. Well, that goes back to show you. I mean, that that's a never get, uh, lesson from Glenn. The never give yeah, up. Yeah, it's exactly. Like, and that, you know? hold on, and and I'm going to tell you, it, it comes back in Lake Three. You know, and um, it, it really taught me that even though we didn't win, we won a daily. We caught the most smalls in the tournament, and we had an epic tournament. Everybody was on cloud nine. You didn't lose. Even, no. you know, even though we went from first to third with a pretty <laughs> kind of, and I call it an embarrassing drop, I was okay with it. And then we go into leg two and those stripies show up and that was the all little ones? Not, or no, um, they were the little ones, are they? No, the two, the not couple the, like, we, the caught, ones we like caught that. like four or five. Yeah, they ours were not little, but they weren't giant, but I got you. 
we we plucked our first we actually set out day one and caught one right out of the gate in a big jump and um our law you know just like everyone else it was very slow fishing except for the rum runner mm -hmm. and then the last day i think it was me andy bob watson and a couple guys we all decided to run to the southeast and we had the best day we had all tournament and we saw three blue ones caught one out of two saw another one that didn't eat and i think we caught six out of eight sales but it that really pulled us up for leg two for just like kind of maintaining. Yeah. And then um, going into leg three, we had some really good fishing, like 30, 40 sail bites, four to five blue marlin bites. I mean, it was just steady good fishing. And luckily again, Matt and Kel coming early enough where um, we, um, we fish hard enough to where we were getting that. And me and Billy were fishing pretty much every day next to each other and just having great fishing. And day one, you know, we go out there and Billy – sets out with that double header blue one and i'm like you gotta be fucking kidding me like that's just the bill fisher doing bill fisher things yeah well billy 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 when billy gets billy and his blue ones and i was like i'll never forget it he called it in and i i was like i, I muted it. i was like chris did she say fucking two of them and he goes yeah and i'm like well there goes the daily and um but there again it goes back to where i mean he did win the daily that day but that's not always the case and um we we went to the southeast that last day of pre-fishing, I ran from, I ran over a hundred miles that day fishing, just mm -hmm. an hour of fishing spots. And we ran to the Southeast. And do you, do you, when you pre-fish like that, do you put yourself on a clock? You'd be like, I'm going to go here. And then do you, if it's good, do you stay? Or do you just, just write it down and say, this is so what I, I saw a, here. I kind of have a plan that I stick to for my pre-fishing. And mm -hmm. as stupid as this may sound, I'll tell you exactly what it is. I have to fish the ladies tournament. The triple crown ladies. Yeah. So I fish Sunday my team, whatever I want to do. Monday is my pre-fish for my ladies for the tournament. Then I pre-fish the ladies. Mm -hmm. I mean, I fish the ladies. And then on Wednesday, we normally fish a half day yeah, yeah. for my team and then come in. Well, that day, I actually asked Matt and Kel, like, can I put a full day in? I'm going to run all over. And they're like, whatever you want to do. So we did, we ran all over. And I normally fish my last day trying to cover ground. Like mm -hmm. I'll, I'll fish a spot, write everybody's reports down, go to the next spot. If there's anybody around me, I'll write what they've seen. And I just try to mentally, you know, I write it down. So I have, but, it. You, but you put a, make a map in your head. You get That's right. Exactly. Right. Yeah. And um, so we went down the first day of leg three and we went down there. I think we actually caught the most fish for the day, but guys, we didn't catch a Marlin. We caught 17 sales. We had a great day. And yeah. we were like fourth or fifth. And then um, the next day we went right back down there and we caught two and eight and won the daily. And then we were, we were not winning the term. I think we were tied for third or second on time. And then day three, I, everybody kept saying they were not going back down there. And I was like, I got to go look at it. Like I just couldn't in my mind win the daily the day before, but I also made a note of what I did in leg one that I can't let that happen again. Yeah. I run back down there. 48 miles to the southeast and um i'll never forget it i pulled the boat back and i looked at gornell and i'm like this ain't the same <laughs> 45 miles whatever it was i said matt this ain't the same and i was getting ready to pick up and jimmy on the haruko called me he's like hey austin i'm five miles below you it looks pretty good so i run down there and we pull it back and i'm like damn it looks good but i'm like matt it, it just doesn't look like it did the day before and he's like well, where do we got to go i'm like a ways and he's like how far i'm like 35 miles. What time is this now? Uh, lines in at eight, right? 747 lines are in at eight. So we picked up and we ran 35 miles. And as we're running, I'm writing down like Tar Heel, Mama C, Bill Fisher, Galati, Fish Tank, Real Joy. You know, I'm writing everybody what they're catching, trying to kind of keep a tally. So I know like when I run in there, maybe where I need to be or where I don't need to be. And um, we set out next between the Tar Heel Mama C, Bill Fisher, John's just picking at him. And I'm like, we saw three lazy fish. And I'm like, fuck this. I am not watching this all day. And um, <laughs> seen the show Eddie, before. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, yeah, exactly. And um, Eddie had called in his second blue one, but I think that was his 30th scene. And then I heard the groan, Brandon on the war party. And I knew they were up there on the blue dots to the West. And I told Matt, I'm like, Matt, I said, Gornell, I was like, Gornell, we're not going to win this tournament here. And we're going to just drop off trying to compete with John. And about that time, when I said to them, we need to go, I looked up, Galati was already in the wind, and Billy's riggers were coming up. 
I'm like, guys, we got to go because that's who I was fishing against. I was fishing against Galati and the Bill Fisher. Yeah, yeah. So I'm like, if they're running and I'm running, they can't beat me. Yeah. I can't beat them. You know, like it was a, it was a, you have to be in the same neighborhood. Like when you're that close, you kind of got to, got to think that, you know, unless you're really know when those guys leave, but there's a reason why they're leaving and taking that risk too. Yeah. So I was like, I was like, Matt, we got to go. He's like, let's go. So we ran another 38 miles and um, I'll never forget it. We were all running and we passed the C fix and the C fix was plucking at him and the Galati boat turned towards the C fix. And then Eddie called in another hookup and then everybody just, full board like you can see everybody got her like ramped up and we were yeah. all running to Eddie and um I never forget it Galati went to the port side Billy went to my starboard side and I just stopped we all stopped at the same time Galati raised a double blue one and didn't get him we raised a quad sail called a double and I think Billy I don't know if Billy had a bite or whatnot but well where we ended up stopping was about a mile f- a mile, a mile and a half from where we had fished the ladies tournament. And that day in the ladies tournament, we raced five blue ones that afternoon with no sonar, or no electronics. Cause I had an electrical issue on the boat in the last hour. Wow. And I was like, as, as, as I was fishing, I wasn't getting bit and I'd hear a blue one here, a blue one. there. I was like, no, I'm going to go tack over here. Where we had some bites and Anthony, I swear to you, I don't know if it was God's favor or whatever, but I'm start tacking that way. And the sun's perfect. And I mark one on the sonar about, 11 o'clock, clear as day, knew it was a blue one. Told everyone it was going to be a blue one. <laughs> Put it in a turn. And I'm not even, I bet I'm not on my chart a quarter of an inch from a, the dot I left from the ladies tournament. And uh, I put it in a chart. I'm like, all right, really good mark here. Marked him 80, you know, right there, 40, I don't know, between like 40 feet, 80 feet. I mean, it was, a, he was, it coming. was a yeah. mark. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, guys, he's coming. And I couldn't even get out of my mouth. Growing I was like, right teaser. And um, I hit man overboard. And, um, and it was a big rip right there. We caught that one. And I just kind of tacked up and tacked down, tacked west, tacked down, tacked east, tacked down. And um, <laughs> it was like every other tack, those rips would pop back up. But I never sewn out another one, but I got over that dot. And here they came. Wow. And um, I'll never forget it. We caught a third one. No, we third caught Blue second, No, we caught our second one there. And then we caught a single sail, missed the sail. And then um, this is where it got kind of interesting. Um, I was getting texts from everybody at home. Like, damn, dude, you're you're about to win the series. You're winning. The, like, I knew I was winning the leg, but they're like, you're winning the series. And then we hooked one, catching our third one. And um, that's what put us, like, kind of up on the leg a little bit. Like, we had jumped the leg, like, 400 points. And um, we're catching that one. And as we set back out, I get a blip, like, literally right inside my turn on the sonar. And I was like, I'd never seen that kind of mark before. And I just started to put the boat in a turn and it just blew it. Woo! Eats a teaser again. And um, it, 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 knowing what I know now, I don't know if I'd change it, but knowing what I know happened, it ate us. This would have been our fourth bite. It ate us. And when it ate the teaser, I went to yank the teaser. When I did it, it just shampooed Kel on the outside flat line. And when it ate her, it ate her so hard. Like she, was t- she came tight quick. And that thing just went off like a scud missile. And I'm like, back it off, back it and no, nothing could have done any different. Yeah, yeah. You know, screaming back it off because you just knew it was just so much drag going so far to hard force. And we ended up straighten the hook out on that one. Ugh. And then set right back out. And I made a tack up, came back down. And it was like, I think it was like 18 minutes, 20 minutes to go. I just made a turn in the thing. And I, I saw something. I'm like, Justin, did you see that? And um, I couldn't even say it again. And Cornell's like, I ain't going to believe it, but it's a blue one on the right teaser. <laughs> Pull the teaser. We end up getting it on the out, our inside rigger, and um, we catch it. And at the time, everyone's texting me, like, when I called it hooked up, they're like, you're going to win the series. So we backed down. I mean, I went through everything. And um, catch the fish, and y'all obviously seen my dance. And um, Yeah, we'll have to put that on the video. Yeah, don't buy that. that. Um I was excited. That's probably the most excited I've ever been in my life. Um, yeah. I thought I thought we had won the series just because of what people had texted me. But what had happened was we had had such a good day that the way the the way the points read for the series is really hard to read on the on the screen. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and and anyway, um, the rum runner still had me on time, but um, it was just it was it was epic, and 
I mean, we were four for five on blue ones, and the other one we just straight the hook on. It was no, I mean, it was yeah, it's like, nobody's fault. Everybody it's did their job. We finished out the series. We won the leg, won a daily, and then we finished out the season with um, two dailies, fourth in the ladies, a third and a first, and tied the series on time. And I just never forget, I looked at Matt and Kel, and at the time, it didn't bother me. I was like, oh, whatever. You know, we had a great year. Now, it bothers me just because it's like to be so close to something that you oh, yeah. dream of. I mean, I'm, I don't know. For people like you and me, I feel like that's that series – for guys who dead bait is 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 close to i don't know the best place the best the most competitive series you know this guy's in in florida that do the, that nick does the kite fishing i think it's it's super competitive but it's just not what we do you know and yeah. then they to that list when series i think the way it's set up and the way the fishing is and the way the points are set up that you know it makes it the most competitive and the who you're fishing against it's like yeah and for me I think a bigger testament to me is just it's not even about competing against like Duffy or Billy and Bayless and Lagrone and Galati. It, 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 a lot of it for me is just to see what the boat has done as a team. Yeah, yeah, know, yeah. Where we put it together and have our team and, you know, and then, you know, I, I'll never forget it. I, I used to tell Alex all the time, like, I just want to stay consistent. And, um, you know, we we had a great season down here. And I told Matt and Kels, like, you know, it's, you can give everything you have and cards fall the way they fall. You know, everybody's like, oh, well, if this one fish, you can't say that. No, the I mean, there's a sure had that or yeah. Glotty or whoever. It's still fishing and at the end of the day and crazy. Shit right. happens, still fishing. You know? And still mistakes happen with everyone. And um, I think the biggest thing that I, 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 I'm most proud of with Matt and Kel and everybody is just like, when we enter a tournament, I feel like if I can get the bites, I'm going to be close because when we went to ocean city this summer, you know, I had to reset with a new mate. Alex wasn't with us. And um, we had an epic season in, ocean city and uh and i'll never forget at the end of the season it, it didn't hit me until four or five days after the mid-atlantic but i was like man if i didn't have the team the anglers nicole matt kelly anthony and the way that everything works out it's just i it'd be tough to explain it to say that it's you know it's it goes further than the boat myself it it, it goes it's a core you know yeah. and, it, and that core has really trumped um a lot of things that I would have believed in years ago. And, yeah. and I'm so blessed for it. Like I said, I, um, it's pretty cool to bring in two mates that have never fished with us and to have the summer we had, like, it just goes to show that that core trumps it. If that makes sense. Like that. Yeah. Yeah. You, yeah. It, it, it you know, if, if you guys have... that know what they're doing, do their job. <clears throat> the anglers are still doing what the, what we've always it doesn't done. Ch- yeah. Having a, having a, you know, a decent to a good, a good mate, show up isn't going to have the effect that say uh, you know if you didn't have your anglers trained the way they were you know like yeah and then and you know the confidence in each other it's not really and and to go one step further i mean matt and kelly are unbelievable with me with the boat if there's something i need and we can make the boat more efficient uh, like for example you know we went to these cjr wheels Mm -hmm. and uh, i'm not sitting here promoting cjrs but i can tell you this for the max vet it has changed the way I fish down here because I was folding blades. You were out there fishing that day. I folded one. Yeah. yeah. And, um, you know, to have that, um, to have that kind of relationship with my boss that I have to be able to do what I'm doing. And if I say to him like, Matt, we got to fix this or we're always going to have an issue. He's amazing with that. And then now with the new boat coming, it's going to be a much more in, you know, detailed program, but it, um, it's very overwhelming and blessed. It's a blessed feeling. And um, I'll never forget 2022 20, fishing on the max bet. Yeah, man. For as long as I live. Well, yeah, because, you know, you were in charge now. It wasn't somebody else. It's your, no, it, it, but you built, you guys built it all. And yeah. you're, you're the cat, like you're the catalyst of it all. You know, like if you're not there, then Kelly, if you don't treat at the beginning, treat Kelly, Matt and Kelly with the patience and respect, who knows where you are and and them believing in you it doesn't it doesn't doesn't typically yeah. you know so but, but it's, a, it's it's a team i mean like i said there's been to, days yeah. when, there's a days when they're like i listen to your podcast a lot and i know what you do on a day in and day out and there's a lot of people that know what anthony pino does on that blood money day in and day out as far as bites go i'm on the other end of i don't have to worry about that very much 
I, I'm very blessed. I'm very blessed that if I get five bites, I feel like they're going to catch four of them. You yeah, know, my guys are pretty good though. I, I'm not saying that, but I just I know that there are days where you were put on a clinic, and if, if if you could throw the flags up for what you saw, it would be a clinic. And and and, and like I said, I don't. I mean, there's not just me saying that. There's numerous people, but I, I I'm a big believer that I'm very blessed to feel that when they say bit, I'm very confident in where we go from that in in our turn. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, how that we handle our turn. And I've had great mates. That's another, I can't credit enough to Alex and even Nick, you know, me and Nick did not see eye to eye and Nick is an amazing fisherman. I, I cannot speak enough about Nick Babel, but we did not see eye to eye in any shape, matter, way or form about fishing together. But I can tell you, it was probably one of the better things that ever happened to me. Knowing what I know now Yeah. at the time, I couldn't stand it, but now I can't thank Nick enough. And we have a, you know, a decent friendship and mute definitely, I, I feel like a mutual respect. Um, but I, I can't thank enough for just everyone. And, um, you know, and, and, and my peers, you know, you, Jason, Johnny and Andy and down here, Legron, Glotti, John Thomas. I mean, Bob, I mean, the list could go on forever with people that have just been supportive. And, uh, and like I said, I, I just, the max bet is one of the things I'm most proud of is that, as a mate, I never thought I ever wanted to build a team as anglers. Yeah. And then to actually do it, I'd almost say it was equals up catching my big fish, if not even trumps it. Well, I mean, it's something I mean, like, I don't know who you caught your big fish with. I mean, I know it was on the swordfish, but, you know, it's not something you worked at. You, you worked at it personally, and maybe you and the captain, Justin, had worked on it for a while, but it wasn't like like you started with – you, Matt, and Kel, and the boat, and then it kind of goes from there. Then you're like, oh, we should go to Costa Rica. That was really awesome. And then you go to Costa Rica, and then you really start to put in the work, you know, like, because the first year, a lot of people don't know that the first year or two years, you didn't fish a tournament or anything. You just yeah. fished. And Actually, we- what, what most people don't know is we've only fished two full series on the max bet. Yeah, yeah. And I think yeah. that's prudent because, you know, I don't, I mean, other than, other than Bayless, I feel like everybody else has kind of had to get down there and figure it out, you know? Like, no, I, don't, I, don't, don't get me wrong. I'm still figuring it out. I mean, no, but, you know, to be to be competitive down there, it seems like you can't just show up. Like, I feel like in Ocean City, sometimes you can show up and make a couple good decisions and land on the right fish and be 90 miles from anybody where they can't touch you. Where here, where down there, it's different, you know? You just you took the words out of my mouth. Down here? You can be getting them, and someone can shut you off like that. Yeah, yeah. And make you look like a zero from a hero quick. Yeah, so And, you I know, just... listen, I'm telling you, when these fish get to biting again down here, like take these marlins out of play and it's sales. Mm-hmm. You know, the year before, when we got third, our, our, the first tournament we ever had a place in on the max bet, we got third in leg two. And we actually caught the most fish for the leg. We caught yeah. 47 sales, but we didn't catch a marlin. And I'll never forget it. Like, it was cool to have, like, Bayless and Galati and these guys, like, Johnny. Hey, dude, it's okay. Like, you can't control the marlin deal. Yeah. I always remembered it. Like, okay, well, I can compete. You know, I felt good about myself. And then them sales go to bite. And you watch Galati and John on that Tar Heel and John Duffy on that Bill Fisher and Billy or whoever. You watch them go to getting them. Yeah. That'll really open your eyes to <laughs> difference of bites and no like my Rob on the Miss AC. He's another one. Just when them guys go to getting them, man, it's it's different level. Yeah, yeah. And um, you know, like I said, um, the thing that's really nice about us is we built a team, and you know, Costa Rica is going to be a home for us for a while, especially now with the new boat coming. And uh, I, uh, I'm very blessed, like I said, for Matt and Kel. And again, I'm I, I'm very grateful for guys like you and Jason and Willie, you know, Andy, Eddie. I mean, I, like I said, I can't name enough, but just people, Anthony Matarese, you know, the guys were always really helpful. Like if I ever had a question, as stupid as it made a scene or might've sounded, y'all never made me felt dumb. And that was kind of one of the things I was always very appreciative of. Well, cause you're a smart guy. Well, I'm just saying it doesn't always have to be that way. <laughs> it's a lot easier in this world to be rude than it is to be nice. Yeah. It takes effort to be, I think a lot of people don't appreciate that. And it was one thing I always appreciated, yeah. you know, like I said, I coming down here and, you know, like Eddie, you look at Eddie. I mean, what he's done in the rock star the last two years has just been impressive. 
Yeah. And that tournament's nice because anyone can anyone can hook them. Well, cool, buddy. Well, you're I wanted to get this this one in before you started you on, on your 2023 series. So I wish you good luck. And I don't necessarily think everybody needs luck, but I don't think I don't think you guys all leave need, it up to luck anymore. So well, you all need a little bit of luck down here, especially any any moment in time those models can go to bite and really change when it's five to one. It can really change a lot of things. Yeah. Well, cool, buddy. I appreciate it. I really Thanks enjoyed this. And uh, yeah, I can't thank you enough, Anthony. I appreciate the podcast and good luck to uh, Team Maxbed on in uh, 2023. So thanks, buddy. Team-